the poll here in a couple of seconds. Thank you for uh, everyone for filling that out and uh, let's get started today. So uh, just to introduce myself, my name is David Grafton. I'm a GIS analyst over here at Bad Elf. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Nick Smolovsky. Uh, he, so we're, what we're the agenda for today is going to be, let me hit next over here, is that we're gonna start covering uh, all the new features of the Bad Elf Flex. And then Nick's gonna take over at the end and talk about some customer stories and how people are utilizing all the awesome new features and affordable accuracy of the Flex. So I uh, appreciate everyone joining. It is being recorded. The meeting will be available on YouTube after the fact here. And uh, feel free to check that out over on our YouTube channel or send it to anyone else who might be interested. So I appreciate it. So let's go get, get, uh, get started today. Uh, yeah, so initially we could give you a quick introduction to the Battle Flex uh, in case uh, you're a little bit unclear on the features and everything we offer. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, kind of cover uh, all the exciting new things that we've been adding over the past year. Uh, we've been doing a biannual update. So we had one update in January, another one in uh, June or July. And these include uh, Ortho Everywhere, which gives you accurate elevation data, no matter which app you're using. Base Rover, which gives you uh, accurate survey grade data, no matter your location or your internet connectivity. Uh, you can use two flexes to get RTK data, no matter where you're at. Uh, wireless file transfers, which makes updating the firmware on the flex uh, much simpler and faster, as well as getting logs off the flex onto your mobile device, very simple. We'll cover a few other miscellaneous quality of life additions. And then, uh, like I said, I'll hand it over to Nick at the end for our customer success story. So let's go ahead. So to introduce our Flex here, it's a highly accurate, affordable GNSS receiver. You can see with this chart right here, we offer a plethora of different correction modes. We're compatible with all mobile devices and applications. Uh, it's many different purposes. Uh, where you can connect with any uh, device, application. It's all fully compatible, no matter which app you're using. We're also able to connect with third-party peripheral hardware like range finders, uh, GPRs, utility locators, LiDAR, drones, and more. And you're only required to pay for the uh, accuracy you need. So how this works is that we have tokens. And so right out of the box, you can go ahead and get 30, 60 centimeter, one, two foot accuracy. But when you need that survey grid accuracy, let's see, you only need it occasionally. You can just load up one of those tokens I was talking about, and then you can connect to your local RTK network for that one centimeter accuracy. Uh, if you're gonna be using RTK all the time, you can also just have it fully RTK unlocked all the time. So uh, very, uh, affordable, easy to use, and as uh, you'll see today, uh, we're making things even easier uh, with each firmware update. So let's get started with the feature that I'm personally most excited about is Ortho Everywhere. So at the end of the day, people need uh, elevations, and these elevations are going to be in the form of orthometric heights or mean sea level. Anywhere that you see an elevation, it's almost certainly in this format. So uh, fortunately, with GPS devices, all of their elevations are going to be something called ellipsoidal elevations. So if you look at this little illustration right here, ellipsoidals are these very smooth, basic models of the Earth, which are great for really quick calculations. Uh, unfortunately, that's not relevant to us. Uh, so we really need to uh, get these ortho heights, but uh, depending on the app and you know the sort of data that's being received, and it's not always uh, quite that simple as far as just uh, sending it directly over. There's going to be different models, uh, different correction modes are going to be using different systems. And so with this Ortho Everywhere feature, we make it much simpler for you. So before, no matter whether you're using an RTK network or just your normal standard SBAS straight out of the box, you're locked either into ellipsoidal or EGM96 when using ArcGIS apps or at other field uh, data collection apps. So it was uh, also necessary to set the full height in both apps. So you can see with both of these factors, it was pretty easy to go wrong. Uh, if you uh, were, uh, so if all of your users were uh, aware enough to set the full height in field maps all the time, you were fine over there. And if you were just collecting data in SBAS, you were probably all right, this EGM96 model. Is, uh, is perfectly compatible with standard mode. But if you're doing any sort of RTK, really high accuracy data collection, 
you're probably seeing some sort of an offset in your elevations. Uh, we had a couple of workarounds around this, but if you're just using it without a lot of knowledge of what's going on, uh, there could be some offsets in the elevation. So now you have complete control over your final uh, data solution. So now your use, so the user can determine which model is used in the ArcGIS, whether you're using quick capture or field maps, uh, now your orthometric model, whichever one you specify, depending on which correction mode you're using, is going to be the one used by the geometry in ArcGIS Online or, uh, or field maps, quick capture, no matter which app you're using. So previously, our workaround was literally to join the track log uh, to the data just by the date on both of the features, and then we had to use a tool to overwrite the geometry. That's no longer necessary. So now it's a very simple checklist-based process where you can go ahead and boot up the Flex app, go through this checklist really quick, just make sure your pole height's correct. Uh, again, I was talking about you had to set the pole height before on the external third-party apps. You'd also have to include the antenna offset, which is 23 centimeters, so it's very easy to forget that. And uh, you would also be kind of worried about double setting it where you might set the pull height over there and over here, and you were worried maybe that might throw off your data. So now you don't have to check that setting anymore uh, over on any external apps. We can go ahead and just set the pull height over here, uh, choose our orthometric model. These two that I have up are the most commonly used. Uh, for RTK, this is what's going to get you into the North American vertical data, which is used by uh, the vast majority of surveyors. Uh, choose your target app, either field maps or quick capture, and then you can go ahead and just turn on auto flow. So provided uh, you've already done this before, you know exactly what configuration, uh, should, what it should look like. This should really just only take a few seconds. You just pop in our app really quick, turn on auto flow, and then you can just go back to your field maps app, collect data like normal, uh, hit your point, fill out the form. But before you submit it, uh, you go ahead and just collect the point on our app. You can either do that just by hitting the center button a couple of times in the flex and just collecting a point. You go back to our app and collect the point really quick. And since we have this auto flow on, that's going to send all of that orthometric information straight over to field maps. And since your geometry is going to be good, uh, your metadata is going to be good. Uh, you're able to store your vertical data now when in the past it was kind of ambiguous and you'll have your correction source and everything else stored in there as well. So not only will your data be correct, but you can also prove it's correct if you have to do any sort of QC. So it's uh, oh, a lot of different variables and everything, but this checklist really simplifies it. And at the end of the day, all you have to do is just turn on auto flow. And then when you're collecting points in field maps, just make sure you collect a point in our end too, and then we'll just send all that good information over. So uh, very straightforward, easy to use. Uh, we also have additional metadata fields that you can add uh, using a tool available to download from our website. Uh, that's not completely necessary if you're just interested in the elevation, but if you really want some more advanced metadata, just kind of store along with your features, uh, definitely uh, either email me or you can go to our website. I can help point you in the right direction and we can get you uh, set on the right path as far as that goes. So kind of even moving forward from just elevation and uh, vertical datums, uh, we also give you the option to select your horizontal datums as well. So whenever you're using RTK, you know, you're streaming external corrections over the internet, you're probably using NAT 83 2011 if you're located in uh, North America. So in the past, you might be using some WGS84 features, which is the default. Let's say you're just creating a layer online. It's probably going to be in WGS84. So now with uh, with this point one navigation feature, you can select if you want to be WS84 or NAT83, because there is a little bit of a difference between the two. If you don't select one and you end up choosing the wrong one, all your data is going to be shifted uh, about three to six feet, one to two meters or so. So this is feature is also available when using base rover RTK, which we'll cover in a bit, where you're literally sending your own RTK corrections from a flex that you set up yourself. So I just kind of define what RTK is really quick it's for anyone who doesn't have a, a clear understanding of it. The purpose of it is just to receive corrections from a GNSS receiver at a known location. So the purpose of this is the other GNSS receivers at a known spot, you can correct for errors that are being experienced at the moment, mostly from weather. So this can improve your accuracy from one to two feet to less than one inch in real time. No post processing required, which can get quite complicated and messy. 
and also very time consuming. This all happens uh, in the moment. So typically this is gonna require an internet connection where you can stream co uh, corrections from your quality local network. This does require credentials and potentially might be paid. And you have to make sure that these base stations that you're streaming corrections from are actually active at the time, which isn't always the case. So enter base rover. So this offers survey grade accuracy anytime, anywhere. It's not internet dependent. All you have to do is just set up two flexes, two radios, and you're good to go. So how this works is that you set up your base, uh, which is gonna be the flex that doesn't move. You're gonna set up on a, either a known point or a brand new point that you can post process later. And the quality at this point is gonna be basically equivalent to the quality of your rover points, or, which you'll be using to actually collect data with. So whatever uh, datum you wanna use, you just use that for your base point and it'll stream over those corrections in that datum as well as with the accuracy of the base point itself. So once you get a nice base point, let's say you're collecting a lot of data in a single location, uh, you can actually enter that in as a reference point. And then so you don't have to worry about uh, having to post process any data, improve your accuracy later, or anything like that. Uh, if you could find an NGS monument, you can just plug that as the reference point, set the base up on that monument and just start setting corrections. So just like everything else, it's a checklist based workflow, just to simplify the setup process. And uh, even if you know exactly what you're doing, it's nice to have that reminder just to uh, confirm that your process is correct. It also gives you a much, much quicker fix than using external RTK over a local network or something. You should get a fix within five to 10 seconds at the absolute most. And it also alerts you of any events or adverse events. Let's say your poll tips over or you lose a GPS lock for whatever reason. So this gives you very reproducible results. Like I said, you can set up over the same uh, reference point again and again. Uh, we also include that Rhinex, just a raw GPS log for post-processing to improve that base point as well as the rovers after the fact. Uh, it offers a 10 kilometer range uh, line of sight with a two watt radio, but it's also compatible with 35 watt radio if you need uh, extreme range. And so, like I said, all adverse events are saved. Uh, it really helps with QC. Everything's in a JSON file describing exactly what the conditions were uh, when you uh, when you were collecting data. So it gives you complete control over the system. So uh, it really uh, reduces your dependence on whatever the uh, the quality of the RTK local systems are. So once you're done uh, with your uh, with your workflow, you know maybe you just finish up your base rover survey. Uh, you're gonna have to transfer all of those files off your Flex. So before it required a USB thumb drive where you had to plug it into the Flex and export everything. Uh, some organizations don't even allow thumb drives because they're a security risk and it requires multiple steps and keeping track of, uh, of more equipment which can easily get lost. So now we do uh, wireless file, file transfers using our Battle Flex app. It only requires your mobile device, uh, your phone or tablet. And you can just go to our app, go to either our firmware update, which will uh, notify you if it requires a firmware update. Uh, just quick clarification for this initial firmware update before uh, we can start doing it wirelessly. You will have to update it manually using the thumb drive one final time. And then, uh, and then you can just do it wirelessly uh, from each point thereafter. So if you look at the image right here, you can see this little orange row. And that lets you know you have a firmware update. You can start your download. It'll go ahead and update your flex, and then uh, you'll be good to go. So it's the same thing, the reverse way. Instead of uploading data onto the flex, you can download data off of it as well uh, with this log transfer. So uh, if you have any track logs, points, you know, those base rover uh, logs, all projects are going to show up under logs in our, uh, our, in our new app version. And you can just go ahead and download those, send it out to, uh, to yourself, you can email to a colleague. Uh, whatever you want to do, it makes it much easier instead of having to transfer everything to a USB drive, plug it into a computer, drag and drop a lot of stuff. You can do everything straight from your mobile device. So speaking of logs, uh, we also enabled automatic track log recording. So we always recommend just recording a track log, which is basically just a history of what your Flex has been doing while you've had it on. Uh, so this is the best practice because it gives you a nice backup for any sort of troubleshooting. Uh, if there's any sort of problem with your third party app, like let's say data wasn't synced. Uh, sometimes people use offline uh, mode a lot on these uh, 
the, these apps and maybe they forget to sync once they get back to the internet connection. Uh, maybe the layers or settings weren't configured properly in that particular scenario. Uh, or maybe you just need additional metadata for needed for QC and you don't have full control over which fields are recorded on the data layer you're recording to. So it's really nice just to have a track log running in the background. Uh, it'll have all the information you could ever need, including the date, you know, lats, longs, accuracy, satellites, uh, datums used, et cetera, et cetera. And all you have to do is just go to configurable, uh, sorry, go to logging settings over on your, uh, your Battle Flex app, hit that radio button, and from then on, every time you boot up the Flex, it'll just automatically start recording these track logs. So we also offer tilt filtering now. Uh, so this is another kind of QC sort of process. So uh, when you're recording a point, uh, obviously I think most people know that you want your GPS device to be, be vertical as possible. If you have it tilted just one degree, that's actually equivalent to uh, three and a half centimeters if it's on a two meter pole, just from the antenna being uh, shifted over the ground. You want you to record the point exactly where your tip of your survey pole is. So using this feature, uh, you just go over to data collection and just select tilt filter point. And this requires you to hold that green dot you can see on this picture. Within that circle, you can set, uh, if you want it two degrees, whatever the tolerance you need is, and just make sure that that uh, point is held within that circle throughout the three second uh, point. We'll collect a point. If not, uh, we're not gonna collect anything. It will force the user to uh, collect it again. So just a, another good uh, QC, you know, a little checklist to make sure that the points are being uh, collected in the correct way. Uh, I know I've mentioned it a few times, but we have checklist-based workflows absolutely everywhere now. Even if you do know exactly what you're doing, it's just nice to have that reminder that everything was set correctly. Maybe last time, like you see over here, this is our laser rangefinder checklist. Maybe last time our laser height was going to be a little bit higher. Maybe a shorter user is using it now. So it's nice to just go through, get that visual confirmation that everything's set right, uh, that your models are set correctly, that everything's connected, and then before you start uh, collecting any data. So uh, this can also provide alerts in case there are any issues. And instead of trying to determine uh, what the issue is and having to go through the troubleshooting process, you can go ahead and look at the checklist, see if, it, if something's checked or not, and then go ahead and rectify that error and then continue on your way. So uh, again, if you don't know what you're doing, it uh, kind of gives you a nice uh, guideline to the whole process. And uh, it's really good, great for advanced users as well. Uh, so finally, another really cool thing is deviation plots. Uh, it's kind of like maybe satellites where it's nice for some troubleshooting to see what's going on in a particular moment but this has a really uh, nice application for uh, shooting checkpoints. So if you have a known location, you go to a checkpoint, make sure your GPS is uh, performing correctly, set up correctly. Uh, you can enter that in into the deviation plot, just uh, kind of center it on here. You can see this plot center right here, enter in those values and make sure that your green dot, your current location is appearing directly on top. If it's not, you're seeing some sort of offset. So this is great just for verifying your device is working properly over uh, you know, a certain monument or checkpoint or, or anything. And uh, there's, there's much more. Definitely stay tuned for our webinars and our socials for updates. We're constantly updating those. Uh, we also offer Pioneer package trainings if you need a little more customizable direct training. And definitely you can direct uh, questions over to me as well. Uh, this is my email right here, david at bad Don't hesitate to ask me any questions or for right now, we can just leave them in the chat and uh, we'll definitely uh, cover those after uh, after Nick here. So uh, let me go ahead and hand it over to Nick and let's cover some uh, customer success stories. Dave, thank you. That was really great uh, showing all the exciting additions to Battleflex. It's almost overwhelming the amount of updates that we've done uh, in the 2020 year. Um, it's a testament to our team for sure. And I just want to reiterate to everybody out there that if you need more explanation on any of the things that Dave just quickly reviewed, please reach out to Dave, myself, Bad Elf in general, and we will make sure uh, to, to help you out. There's Dave's email one more time, david at bad-elf.com. These are very exciting additions. Um, and again, I just want to make sure that the resources are there. We will be doing some uh, shorter videos. If you've noticed recently, we've been really upping the content of our YouTube channel. And so we will also be doing some uh, focused uh, 
uh, kind of DIY, for lack of a better description, videos on these different processes as well. So thank you again, Dave. Um, as Dave mentioned, we wanted to just kind of highlight a couple different companies. Uh, of course, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies that uh, utilize the Flex, but this uh, these are some fun ones. Uh, WGI is a multi-state uh, company based out of Florida. Uh, they currently own several Bad Elf Flexes. Uh, they're a full-scale engineering company, uh, but they do a lot of uh, geospatial focus and underground utilities, uh, for that matter, above ground utilities as well. And you can see on the screen here uh, that they're doing potholing and they've got a GPR device and they're doing directional drilling and piping. Um, on the left-hand side there, you can see this little stick figure. They created a mock-up. But for a um, long story short, they're now using the Bad Elf Flex actively for SU, subsurface utility engineering, and that's for uh, quality levels A, B, C, and D. Um, they also have made a custom application uh, that utilizes a GoPro camera that's voice activated. So they're taking pictures as they're walking along as well. Uh, and then they are pumping all of their data into an Esri ArcGIS Online. Dave, can you uh, uh, switch the slides, please? So you can see here, as the SU data are coming in, uh, they have dashboards created in the Esri ecosystem, and they are pumping out all of this live to the different stakeholders and constituents that are interested in these types of data. Uh, can, next slide. What's also very interesting is they have uh, successfully been able to automate about 80% of this process. And so the surveyors, GIS professionals are out in the field uh, taking the locations with the Flex and ArcGIS. Uh, these data are going up into the cloud automatically, uh, populating feature classes. These feature classes then are uh, coming down in the reporting mechanisms of Arc Pro, uh, and they are auto-populating these types of uh, utility reports. You can see on the right hand side there that there are some of the information from field maps and then that is populating into the fields of these types of reports, which really uh, quickens the process um, and, and really eliminates some of the error every time a human being has to touch a number, touch a text box, type in something, copy and paste something, we know that that can become a problem. And so they have done a bunch of custom scripting and so that they're pumping these reports. Okay, Dave? Uh, these um, are also some final reports from the company, and I just want to make mention here that it's important to note that uh, a registered land surveyor or a professional engineer are stamping these plans. So the data that are being produced by the Battle Flex has gone through an incredibly long and rigorous testing process, and they are, you know, obviously showing off that the authoritative data that the Flex is creating for them is worthy of being stamped by a professional engineer. Here's another fun story. Uh, this one's out of Arizona. WGI, I mentioned, was out of Florida. They do uh, they have a flex in the Chicago land area, a couple in Texas, a couple in Florida. They move around. This, uh, this is a fun story out of actually Cave Creek, Arizona, pretty close to where Dave lives. And uh, it's a company called Engineering Mapping Solutions, and they were working with the city or town of Queen, Queen Creek. This is actually an Esri case study. If you're more uh, interested to read up more on this, you can check it out online. Uh, but this company has attached their Bad Elf Flex to an e-bike, and that e-bike has a tablet also and a GoPro sometimes, and they go out and ride the streets effectively and go and collect utilities, and you can see the picture there, um, at a very quick short order. What I like about this story is it's extremely sustainable. It's on an e-bike. Uh, I can't, I, I'll tell you what, if it was the fall uh, in, in Arizona and I got the opportunity to ride a bike around Cave Creek or Queen Creek or any of these beautiful neighborhoods and collect utilities, I would be there in a heartbeat. Um, so this is a really cool, interesting way to quickly collect information uh, with the Flex and, um, you know, have a little fun. So this is our friend, Nick. Uh, Nick has actually recently retired and uh, he is a 35 year uh, geologist uh, out of West Virginia. Uh, Nick has been using battle equipment for quite some time. But this is a fun story where he's actually doing core sampling uh, for uh, checking out the soils and geological types at these different rock quarries. He takes the core sample, he takes the positioning with the flex and that image in the middle there is actually 360 degree cameras. And so he creates uh, effectively Google Earth uh, street view bubbles of where he collects these data. And then he populates it on a website uh, so that all of the people that need to know 
um, uh, where these things are, what it looks like, uh, the environment around what's being collected. Uh, it's a really good way to, to do that. And again, this is really high accuracy data being produced by the FLEX, but this time uh, for a actually a geological process. You might have uh, been in a webinar, um, I think a month or two ago, um, that Dave put on with our friend Aaron Musgrave over at the Desert Botanical Garden. Uh, this is a neat story. Uh, we actually, um, Battle Flexes are probably in about a dozen or so uh, botanical gardens across the United States and out of the country. And so uh, heavy usage in the world of tree mapping, canopy mapping, uh, any type of biological mapping, um, environmental mapping. What's interesting about this, they have thousands of collections out there, and a lot of what they're collecting are what are called mammillaria or small, like hedgehog cacti, things that are very tiny, and so you need to have a good spatial resolution and be able to have uh, good accuracy, even when you're in thick canopy cover um, of trees and saguaro cacti, things like that. So here we are using the Battle Flex to help inventory and keep specimens alive at uh, botanical gardens around the world. And some of those botanical gardens, for an example, like out of Atlanta in, in Georgia, they send out researchers all the time with the Battle Flex to actually go do field work outside of the premise of the, uh, or the, the grounds of the, of the garden. Okay, I think that was about it. Um, I, I, I thought I had one more slide about a, a customer who had uh, rigged up their Flex to a GPR device, but I guess it didn't make the cut. Um, Dave, I know you mentioned you wanted to turn on our videos again, and we can do our live Q&A if there's any questions. And so you can definitely do the question and answer. There has been a couple answered. Uh, let us know. I mean, I just, I want to hit it home again that we've had a lot of updates and these updates are pretty exciting. If any of these updates are interesting to you, reach out to us and we will absolutely run you through the process. That ortho anywhere is a big time upgrade, um, especially when, oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, so here's a university that's actually uh, doing ground penetrating radar where they've rigged the flex directly to um, interact with their GPR device. And so this is another great example of having high accuracy and, and being able to connect to other peripheral devices. Dave mentioned at the beginning of the uh, presentation that we, our customers are often using our stuff with laser rangefinders and utility locators and GPR devices and LIDAR. Um, we've, we've been hooked into a bunch of different, um, you know, third-party peripheral devices, and it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, thank you, Dave, <laughs> for showing that. Um, but yeah, so as I was saying, the, the key with that ortho anywhere, if you were an Esri customer and you're using one of their uh, softwares, there was, you know, a little bit of a hiccup there with that, that older uh, datum as, as Dave has mentioned, and uh, this eliminates all of those issues. However, it also helps that if you need to create plans or some type of deliverable, say an engineering or survey deliverable that would be in an elevation that a designer or an engineer would recognize, aka an orthometric height versus an ellipsoidal height, this is a really easy way to pass those data automatically right into your Esri system. And so you're not having to go find a, something to transform it or some online, you know, NCAT tool, or you're trying to merge files. It, it just makes life so much easier. Yeah, I would highly recommend if you're interested in Z valleys or elevation at all, and you're using ArcGIS field maps or quick capture, definitely use this function. Uh, it's like Nick said, it just makes it so much easier. Uh, just be aware of that you'll be using one model if you're using RTK and a different model if you're not. Uh, but it just makes sure that lines up with whatever you want your deliverable to be in. So just check those specs, make sure it lines up. And uh, yeah, just a matter of going in and collecting a point whenever you're using field maps just on our end. So just hit that center button a couple of times. We'll shoot it right over. And you're good to go. Right. Absolutely. And you know, one other thing I was just thinking about that obviously is my favorite update, as I mentioned, or as Dave even said, we're both real excited about, but it's also the, um, Dave mentioned the logging. And so being able to transfer logs wirelessly, being able to um, upgrade your flex without having to use a USB stick, that um, that's a big step. There are many customers out there that have issues with their government agencies, for an example, utilizing USBs uh, because of security purposes. And so we get past that it, again it's just 
that quality of life Dave mentioned, it's, you know, this, this unit is continuing to evolve. And so I, maybe I'd wrap this up my, my, my rambling here, cause we're about two minutes over um, that again, this is a testament of how much we're developing the flex. You've seen a lot of updates this year and we have a lot of updates in store for 2023 as well. So there's lots of longevity and life in this unit. And so, you know, if you need more of them, let us know. If you have questions, let us know, tell your friends. Um, you know, we're really excited about what the future holds for the Flex and Bad Elf in general. And, you know, just really appreciate your time. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, thank you, everyone. And uh, if you, no one else has any questions uh, and you think of some later, feel free to email me at david at bad-elf.com. Definitely help clear that up for you. And if you have any trainings you want to put on your team, uh, we definitely support that through our Pioneer Package trainings. And uh, yeah, feel free to contact us about it. So yeah, thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. And uh, this meeting will be up on YouTube shortly. So thank you. Thanks, everyone.